one. Hello, and welcome to Democrats Discuss. My name is Joe McNamara. I'm chair of the Rhode Island Democratic Party. Uh, today, we are very fortunate to have with us uh, Professor June Speakman of Roger Williams University and their political science department. Also uh, with the professor is uh, no stranger to Democrats and all Rhode Islanders, Clay Pell, former uh, candidate for governor. Uh, the, he was actually the foreman of our uh, Democrat contingent at the Democratic uh, Convention. And Clay has been elected as one of our state's four electors. So uh, welcome to both of you. It's great to have you here today. Thank you. Uh, we have to talk about this election. I know uh, we were together, Clay, on November 8th, and uh, many of us went to bed that night thinking the election was going to be close, but we woke up and were, some of us shocked, some of us horrified, but almost universally uh, very surprised at the outcome and uh, the election apparently of uh, President-elect uh, Donald Trump. Uh, Professor, what was your take on this uh, in terms of the pundits, et cetera? Mm. Well, certainly everyone was wrong with their predictions, although if you look at the polling numbers, they were not wrong by much, except they all aired on the on the wrong side. So it's not that some said he would win and some said she would win. They all said she would win by a little bit and they were all wrong by just enough to mislead us all. And I, I think what went wrong for her was a, even though she did everything right, political scientists say you need a good ground game, you need a lot of money, you need a big TV campaign. Donald Trump mounted an unusual, unconventional campaign and had a message that reached people that not a lot of folks were paying attention to. And I think that's, that's why he won. I mean, I look at that, especially the Rust Belt. I'm, if we look at previous histories of presidential elections, those auto workers, the blue collar union people, uh, I, some people will refer to them as lunch pail Democrats mm -hmm. that were always there. And is that the message that Democrats missed in this election? Well, apparently, uh, Democrats' policies are always better for folks in that category, but the message did not reach that, those voters this time. Right. And, and, uh, yeah. I think a lot of the reason for the surprise was actually how the media covered the election. So the coverage was very much who is ahead. Mm -hmm. who, Hillary is ahead. Hillary is ahead. What are the polls saying? And so the focus was all, all there. And so, of course, people were, were very much surprised. But like June said, if, if the media had covered issues along the way, so instead of who's ahead in the horse race, who's having a scandal today, the question w that they were looking at was who has a health care plan, who's looking at college affordability, then not only would we might have had a different approach to the election, maybe even different results, but I think we would also have a very different, uh, we wouldn't ha be dealing with the same level of shock that I think people, people were today. Right. And Clay, I know you're very close with uh, President Clinton and Secretary Clinton. Uh, do you think they were as su surprised as all of us with this? I, I think that there was a collective sense that she was ahead, and I think that was felt felt by everyone. Uh, there, we, there was a sense of uh, energy. Uh, there were people who are mobilized, but a lot of those late-breaking voters uh, went with Trump. And so I, I do think that there was, there was a, a sense of surprise. But, uh, but in the end, it was ultimately a very, very close election. And what has not been said yet uh, in this program is that she, in fact, won the popular right, vote, popular vote yeah. by more than 2 million votes. So there's a real question not only about how the campaign was run, but I, I do think that that's important uh, to, to recognize. And that, so it's not as if you know, there were, uh, I, you, the result is important. But sometimes if you look solely at the result, you can forget that there were 64 right. million people or more who, right. who came out and voted for that, that view of the country. And they still need to be represented. Right. And when Trump and his supporters and the folks on Fox News say the American people have spoken, 
well, most of them, more of them spoke for Hillary Clinton than for Donald Trump. So I think it really is important for Democrats to hold on to that idea that their, their program was not rejected outright. In fact, more folks embraced it than embraced Donald Trump's program. And, and I think Democrats need to organize around that moving forward. Now, it's interesting, June, getting back to the polls, yeah. how they could be so wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, is it because people are abandoning their landlines and that when you poll just using landlines that you get a much narrower perspective of the race? That's part of it, and uh, some pollsters have been able to use cell phones as well, but it's also the case, I think, in this particular campaign that you had the secret Trump voters who simply would not respond to pollsters. So Hillary Clinton supporters were oversampled and Trump supporters were undersampled. And in fact, my students were out doing an exit poll on, on um, election day, and they found that people who had voted for Trump were, would not answer their questions. Interesting, mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. Uh, I noticed in running phone banks at the Rhode Island Democratic uh, headquarters, we had the weekend before the election, I know Saturday, that Saturday we did 14,000 calls relating to local elections, to getting people out, and it was very successful in terms of contact. Mm -hmm. But uh, it makes you wonder that uh, in question, politic political science from here on in, I'm sure yes. we'll see much different sampling and uh, evidence. Professor, in p the past history, I know Al Gore won the popular vote. Mm -hmm. And how many times has this occurred where a presidential candidate has won the popular vote but lost the uh, election? Four, four other times in American history. Four other times. Right? The, the race that you mentioned in 2000, and then in 1888, uh, Benjamin Harrison versus Grover Cleveland, 1876, Hayes and Tilden, and 1824, John Quincy Adams huh. and Andrew Jackson. It's happened four other times. But never has the difference between the, the popular vote been as big as it is this time. Do you think the Electoral College has outlived its usefulness or should be changed? I thought that in 2000, but apparently nobody agreed with me. So I think it today, but I, I don't imagine. Changing the Constitution is very heavy lift. And I, I think even if right now people are upset with the result, at least Democrats are, I'm not sure there's energy to change the Constitution. Although there is this intermediate step that Rhode Island has, yeah. which as I understand it, we're one of 11 states where um, uh, that have actually chosen to go with the popular vote down the line. Right. right. We voted, uh, I believe, in 2008 to be part of an interstate compact agreement, whereas once states have the 270 electoral votes, once those states have all agreed to go to the national popular vote, then as soon as the next popular vote that wins, those states automatically will vote for the president, and uh, that will change history. So mm -hmm. right now, I believe we have 116 electoral votes, uh, very f progressive states that have joined, like Rhode Island, and uh, hopefully that'll change. I know I've received a, quite a few emails, maybe 20, within the last week with people saying, we know Rhode Island has it, Could, will you promise to keep it and fight for it nationally? Mm -hmm. And ab absolutely, people are yeah. uh, very concerned about this. I imagine you'll see energy behind that effort. It's as a political science professor who, who bores people with talk about process and, and procedural matters, I've, I'm, uh, I guess, pleased to see so many people talking about the Electoral College and the national popular vote and other, uh, other kinds of procedural things that may or may not have helped or hurt one party or the other. Uh, that's again, that's the boring stuff, but it's also the stuff that matters, mm -hmm. as we've seen in this election. Well, I, when we were debating the national popular vote, I remember bringing up the movie Swing Vote, mm -hmm. which came out in 2008, and the premise is the, of the uh, movie was, and it was a comedy, was a gentleman that lives in a trailer in the, the New Mexico desert, has his ballot mangled by the machine, 
and the, the presidency comes down to his one vote. And uh, he's in his trailer, he's a big stock car fan, and he looks outside and there's Jimmy Johnson with his stock car saying, hey, you wanna go for a ride? He takes him out yeah. to the desert. President's waiting for Air Force One <laughs> to lobby him. So, you know, it was a comedy, but it really stressed mm -hmm. to me the fact that every vote counts. And part of the debate was very interesting in that people that were against it said we won't get as many uh, presidential candidates visiting mm -hmm. Rhode Island. Right. But when we look at this last election, 60% uh, of the visits and resources from both candidates were really about five states. Right. And that's where the, this election took place mm -hmm. in those five states. Whereas I think with a, a, the popular vote, all of the votes are equal mm -hmm. and people have to run a, a, a different campaign that is nationwide. Right. So uh, we, will see we will see how that works out. Yeah. And how were your students taking the results of this uh, professor on campus? Well, it's, it's a mix. Roger Williams has, uh, students at Roger Williams span the political spectrum because we have a business school and a criminal justice program. You do tend to have some students who are on the more conservative side of the spectrum, but then of course the anthropologists and uh, some of the political scientists are not there. So the discussion has been uh, energetic, I guess you could say, but certainly not one dimensional. Uh, we, we try to keep things as cool as we can. A lot of students don't want to talk about it at all. And I did ask them about how Thanksgiving went, and they said most of them did not talk about it at the table. Interesting. Mm -hmm. One thing that I've gotten asked a lot about is, uh, part particularly for Democrats who supported uh, Hillary, uh, now that the election is over, what can people do? Right. And what's a useful way to be involved? And, uh, so that's been a lot of the conversation that I've been having, mm -hmm. and, and I think you know if I could just share with your sure. viewers, it's you know supporting those organizations that uh, social service organizations that might get hurt uh, in an administration that doesn't provide some of the same funding. Um, it's making sure that we hold uh, the new president accountable uh, up to our constitutional standards for what we expect, and then and then running for office, getting people. People need to get out there and get involved and, and not simply observe. We, we have to be energized by this and really move forward. I mean, I agree, Clay, and I felt the energy especially, and Rhode Islanders almost have a sixth sense politically. Uh, we ran out of Hillary signs at Democratic headquarters. We were handing out paper with wireframes and asking <laughs> people to write their own signs. But Rhode Islanders, love political science. They like yard signs. They like bumper stickers. They uh, enjoy, it's like politics of like a sporting event yeah. in Rhode mm -hmm. Island. So we're very involved and I really felt as though that part of the election process was ignored. And I know that because I was constantly begging for <laughs> more signs mm -hmm. for uh, our supporters, but you're 100% right. People have to get involved. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, regardless of the issues that you're involved in, whether it's religious freedom and uh, or the LBGT community. I know uh, our caucus members are very upset about uh, possible assault on their rights, but people have to get involved. And uh, it's critically important. And there are many ways to get involved, uh, particularly with the Democratic Party. You can go to our website. We're constantly uh, looking for help, and we're already planning to get folks in place for the next election and looking for good people, especially at the local level, mm -hmm. uh, to run for office and uh, get involved. And I know in Warwick, we had a, a school committee race that had, I think, uh, 16 or 17 people for mm -hmm. two final candidates, a uh, great deal of debate. So uh, very, very interesting, but I, I think it's critical that people get involved at uh, this point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor, are there political groups on campus like the college Democrats, are they active? 
Yes, they are. The college Democrats and the college Republicans are both very active. I think the Democrats are a bit deflated. They had booked their tickets for the inauguration. Uh, they're still going to go because they had already paid for the plane tickets, but it's going to be a different kind of experience for them. Uh, the college Republicans are less vocal on campus at this particular period. So much depends. You know, the students come and they go after a four-year cycle. Um, and there's a conservative group, the Young Americans for Freedom, are also uh, very excited about the outcome of this election and the return of free enterprise economics to the United States. So they, they, do, uh, they are active. Very good. There, and there are also the, the interest groups, uh, the Planned Parenthood the, and the LGBT rights groups that are also increasingly, they increasingly understand the impact that national politics has on their causes, which is good. It's good to see the energy uh, added. I wish it hadn't been this way, but mm -hmm. it's good to see them uh, energized and focused on politics. I know we did a uh, voter registration drive at CCRI mm -hmm. last year, yeah. and I know the... Uh, one of the issues that kids, the students, were really excited about is our LBGT right. uh, caucus and our concerns with LBGT rights yeah. and our support of those rights. Mm -hmm. But also looking analytically at this election, we know when we look at the national map, we can see that the coasts are blue and the mm -hmm. interior is red. But Looking at our state as well, we can see that the coastal communities supported uh, Secretary Clinton and some of the interior uh, communities supported Trump mm -hmm. in a big way. Mm -hmm. uh, I am looking at this and thinking, what message are we not delivering as Democrats? Because many of these people uh, the, certainly in Michigan, the factory workers, the union workers in Pennsylvania, they were lunch bucket Democrats, mm -hmm. construction workers. What message are we not communicating with them? Well, I, I think in Rhode Island, it's, it's more rural and suburban voters who did not vote for Secretary Clinton, which, again, is, is part of the messaging that was problematic about, uh, and I, it's puzzling to me, and I don't know if you can speak to this as well, but it's puzzling to me why, we, we've all been hearing this talk for a long time because we hang out in democratic circles, but what the difficulty was in framing that message and delivering that message to voters who are concerned about their economic Stability and again, the ec the economy is not right. awful right now. President Obama has managed to create 10 million jobs. The unemployment rate is half of what it was. So I I am mystified actually to why Trump's economic message resonated so well. But that's probably because I live inside my Democratic echo chamber. I don't know. What do you think? Clint? I think we need a bolder economic message. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that if we, Trump was. So he had an ability to grab so much attention. Yeah. Um, so it, in some ways, you, you never will know, because the, pl the playing field was such that issues were not really covered very much. Right. But had they been covered, I still think that if we wanted a better chance, a bolder message would have gotten, strong, gotten through in a stronger way. Um, for example, Bernie Sanders won the state of Rhode Island in the primary. Mm. And that was very much through, if you could look at some of the messaging that they used in that campaign, it was a, a bold economic message of uh, tackling college uh, debt issues, of tackling uh, job issues. And so that, that does, I think, the, Think penetrate, but you have to give it a chance. And I think what also penetrated was the the Trump's uh, strategy of just pulling her reputation down relentlessly. The relentless yeah. focus on mm -hmm. emails, which the media bought right into, uh, which again, compared to his record, is minor. I'm not dismissing it, but it is a minor issue compared to some of the things that Donald Trump did. But but for for some reason, and when you when you talk to Trump supporters about why, when I talk to them about why they voted for him. It has more to do with her. She's corrupt. She's a criminal. And so why that message resonated so well, uh, it, you know, I have my no. theories about it, but. The high negatives, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think that his message about trade and manufacturing, definitely pounding away at that. And I think right here in Rhode Island of uh, a machine shop that used to be on 117, employing 
70 or 80 people, and these are jobs for NC milling machines and numerically controlled lathes that, uh, you know, these guys are getting paid 20 to $50 an hour. So these are good jobs that are no longer there. Us, the Democrats, talking about increasing the minimum wage for that former machine shop worker or that former uh, auto worker in Michigan, mm-hmm. they know we don't mm-hmm. want the increase in the minimum wage. We want manufacturing back. And mm-hmm. whether President elect Trump can deliver on that issue or not, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But I, I do know, and some of the things we can possibly like, and when people say, oh, Joe, what do you think? I said, I like the fact that he's talking about infrastructure. Because a, a, a federal infrastructure program puts people back to work. And we know in Rhode Island, we've got uh, plenty of infrastructure that could uh, needs repair. So. Uh, I'm optimistic about that. I am horrified about his uh, educational plans. And that could, from uh, uh, just a a K through 12 perspective, when we see programs like Title I, that has been one of the most successful programs in terms of uh, engaging children in poverty and children that need a hand in terms of reading development being threatened, uh, an emphasis on privatizing education, I think, is selection of Mm -hmm. the uh, new uh, director of the Department of Education is concerning, to say the least. To say the least, yeah. To say the least. you know, probably his best pick that sounds a little bit controversial now is uh, Governor Romney mm-hmm. coming in. And I guess from some of the uh, advocates that are out there last weekend, the, a lot of a lot of Trump's people are not happy with that. Mm-hmm. Professor, how big an issue will those selections be in terms of Donald Trump's support as a president? Support from his base? His base, yeah. Well, for now, it's it's looking good for the base, right? The, the, his choice for HHS secretary oh, is yeah. also, if you have any relatives or friends or yourself on Medicare, Medicaid, or Obamacare, you've got, you know, hold on to your hat because this this gentleman is very conservative and wants to dismantle or privatize, voucherize all of those programs. And, and so uh, that will, I don't imagine that pleases working class voters, many of whom are dependent on those programs. Uh, and, and so I think as you'll see some of the implementation, if in fact these nominees are appointed and they are able to implement their agenda through Congress, the, the working class white folks who voted for Donald Trump in Western Rhode Island and throughout the Rust Belt will not be pleased with the policy results. And as Clay said, we need, uh, Democrats need to uh, hold the president accountable for the consequences of his policy decisions. But I do think, you know, cabinet appointees matter. They matter. Yeah. Absolutely. Any thoughts on that, Clay? I, I agree. I think a lot of the appointments so far have been troubling. We'll wait and see uh, for the remainder of the cabinet. But We cannot afford to stand by at this point. This is a time to look at what people need, what uh, health care that they're relying on, the educational system that they're relying on, uh, and and make sure that those things, if they are not funded, at least people know about them uh, in the next election cycle so that people can, in fact, hold uh, the the, uh, incoming president accountable for the consequences in in people's lives. And also for the consequences of increasing infrastructure spending and cutting taxes at the same time. Reagan tried that with increasing defense and cutting taxes. And what do you get is a gigantic deficit that Bill Clinton worked for eight years to close. So that has to be pointed out as well. Wow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I especially on the K through 12 funding, uh, when people have said to me even during the campaign, well, Joe, you know, these, this school lunch program, do we really need that? I said, yes, because if children and students, if their basic needs aren't met, like, you know, giving a kid an enriched donut, orange juice and milk is not a communist plot. It allows that child to 
go to class and learn. Mm -hmm. I said, look at it this way. We're protecting our investments. Yep. We are investing eight to $12,000 every year in that child's education. And if they're hungry, that investment, they can't succeed. They can't succeed. They, so I find it very, very troubling. And even with Title I, the idea that it was meant to supplement, not supplant, state funding. And we're hearing out of Washington right now that they want to be able to supplant state funding. So in other words, when it comes in, oh, that's, we don't have to pay as much. We're going to lower taxes because we're using that federal funding that was formerly targeted for these great programs to uh, fund basic education. So, and I know for higher ed, I was at a, a college board meeting this morning. And the discussion was, they were asked me, they said, Joe, how is Trump, what, where is he on higher education? And I just said, you know, don't hold your breath because uh, I don't think it's a priority. And uh, certainly college affordability. We heard a lot of talk and it's a huge, huge issue. As you know, being a, a professor mm -hmm. in higher education, a huge, issue. And uh, when I speak to my uh, son and daughter, their friends and the loans that they have. And, you know, we know one of our uh, young Democrats was telling me she works a whole other job. She said, I, she works, has a good job. And she said, I, I wanted a new car. So she works an extra 25 or 30 hours a week to afford that. Mm -hmm. So, right. uh, very, very difficult. Yeah. yeah. And in the absence of federal leadership, what's going to happen is the increasing responsibility of the state right. in, in that discussion. And yeah. so we're going to all end up, uh, for those of us who want high quality, publicly affordable education, we're going to have to be, be ready to stand up for it. Well, I think that states have really, with this kind of dysfunctional uh, Congress, become the incubators for democracy and mm -hmm. innovation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a trend that we're going to see continue. And uh, Depending so, on the state, of course. Depending on the, the state. Other way. Yeah, yeah, right. Rhode Island's yeah. good. But, Rhode Island's yeah. good, right. So well, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for visiting us today. Uh, I mm -hmm. appreciate it. Sure. and. Uh, getting some uh, background from, you know, what's happening in our schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, Clay, thank you very much. Are you nervous about this, uh, the process of being an elector? It's, I know it's a big, it's going to be at the State House. It's right? going to be at the State House. It's going yeah. to be on the 19th, all across the country. All the electors get together the same day in their own respective State House. And I, I'm not nervous. I'm looking forward to it very much. And it's an honor to be part of the process. So Rhode Island is one of those states that, that you have to support the candidate that won the state. There are only two, I believe, that distribute the electors uh, proportionately, Maine, Maine and, and Nebraska. Nebraska. Mm -hmm. So Rhode Island, there's nothing you're voting for Secretary Clinton. I plan to vote for the, the person that the people voted for, which was Secretary Clinton. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in today. This is uh, Democrats Discuss. My name is Joe McNamara. And remember, democ democracy works when you get involved in your community. Thank you.